In the fast-paced gospel of St. Mark, much has already happened by the time we pick up halfway through the third chapter in today's reading. People are already sorting themselves out with respect to how they relate to Jesus. Broadly speaking, there are four groups. The crowds. The crowds are made up of curious and fascinated people. They are looking for what they can get from Jesus, healing. We've heard he had cured lepers, driven out evil spirits, restored a man's hand that had withered. They see Jesus as one who makes people's lives better. They see Jesus as good. Helping people is a good thing. What he is doing is very interesting and might prove beneficial to them or someone they know. Jesus to them is a bit of a celebrity, someone to keep their eyes on. The second group, the religious leaders of the day, those who are heavily invested in the Jewish religious institution, they are wary of Jesus. They see him bending Sabbath rules, healing people on the Sabbath, picking grain on the Sabbath. They make note that Jesus and his disciples do not follow the fasting rules of religious people. Jesus responds, it's not time for fasting, it's a time for feasting because the bridegroom himself is present. The religious leaders question his association with tax collectors and sinners, unclean people like the lepers. In today's reading, we heard that they are questioning his power over unclean spirits. Perhaps, they say, he is drawing on satanic powers. You see, exorcism comes from having either a stronger demon or having God's power. That's how you drive out demons, with a more powerful demon or by God. Jesus rejects the accusation on logical terms, that house divided argument we heard. And he speaks of an unforgivable sin against blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Perhaps this sin is unforgivable because the one who makes it, commits it, has good and bad reversed in their minds. Maybe they are beyond hope. The third group, friends and family. They are beginning to believe what they are hearing some say about Jesus. He's gone out of his mind. He's mad. Now in antiquity, the most basic social organization was family. And Jesus, we hear, radically redefines what a family is. He says his family are those who do God's will. But let's give Jesus's mother and brothers and Jerusalem's scribes and Pharisees the benefit of the doubt. They all may have wanted more than anything else to do God's will. So may we in pew and pulpit, we want to do God's will. But the trap ever before us is to define the kingdom's boundaries and the will of God according to 
what is true, what is right. Not according to what we think is true and what we think is right, but what is actually in the divine's mind as true and right. Discerning God's will isn't easy. It takes much prayer, much learning, careful thought, and listening, which leads us to the fourth group, those who are followers of Jesus, committed disciples, prepared to walk with him, to learn from him, to listen to him, to be changed by him. <clears throat> Immediately before today's passage in Mark's gospel, we read, Jesus went up the mountain and called to him those whom he wanted and they came to him, and he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him, and to be sent out to proclaim the message, and to have authority to cast out demons. Jesus appoints 12. These were 12 who had already spent time with him, were listening and watching him, it seems that they were already on their way, having chosen to follow him. And now Jesus appoints them to remain with him, even to be sent out in his name, even to do what he does. To which group? Do we belong? Very likely we can see within ourselves that we have some of the characteristics, offer some of the same responses, struggle with the same challenges that those in the various groups I delineated. We might cling to the status quo of our beloved religious institutions and habits. While we might not accuse Jesus of being mad, we might feel or have others suggest that we're mad if we were to act like him, if we were to be fully committed to living the entirety of our lives as disciples of Jesus. These, it seemed to me, are fluid categories. We can change and we do change. We saw it happen to biblical characters. Nicodemus, the religious leader who came to Jesus in the last days of Jesus' life. Judas Iscariot, one of those 12 whom Jesus names as an apostle, who betrays him. The family members who are calling Jesus in, or calling him out to be with them because they think he might have lost his mind, some of those family members were at his cross. Certainly some crowd members came to follow Jesus, variously falling into and out of doing the will of God. Wanting to do God's will, Howard Thurman offered a prayer. Howard Thurman was an American author, a philosopher, a theologian, a Christian mystic, an educator, and perhaps best known as a civil rights leader. As a prominent religious figure, he played a leading role in many social justice movements and organizations 
during the 20th century in which he lived. In 1944, Howard Thurman co-founded the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco. In 1944, Howard Thurman, a black man, started an interracial congregation intentionally designed to break through the barriers that separated people on the basis of race, color, creed, or national origin. Surely some thought him mad in that day. But he prayed this prayer. Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. Here is the citadel of all my desiring, where my hopes are born and all the deep resolutions of my spirit takes wings. In this center, my fears are nourished and all my hates are nurtured. Here my loves are cherished and all the deep hungers of my spirit are honored without quivering and without shock. In my heart above all else, let thy love and integrity envelop me until my love is perfected and the last vestige of my desiring is no longer in conflict with thy spirit. Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. What are our loves? What are our desires? Like Thurman, perhaps we too need to recognize that it's a mixed bag, our heart, our loves, our desires. Like Thurman, it should be our prayer that our hearts be made holy. I think that is the prayer we make every Sunday when we say together, Lord, have mercy upon us and write both these thy laws in our hearts, that is to love God and to love our neighbor. The ancient people of Israel would have done well to have prayed such a prayer, prayer, such a prayer before proposing to Samuel that they be given a king like the other nations. St. Paul's heart must have been transformed in the spirit of this prayer so that he was transformed from an angry man hell-bent on destroying the early church to become one of the greatest builders of the church, pouring out his life for the sake of others. We heard it spoken from the second letter to the Corinthians. Yes, everything is for God's, for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. St. Paul prays that his heart may be holy. A thought that echoes with the psalmist in the closing verse that we read and responded to. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O oh Lord, your love endures forever. 
Do not abandon the works of your hands. Do not abandon you or me as we pray for our hearts to be made holy. Let us rest assured in that psalm refrain, the Lord will make good his purpose for me. Ah, yes, the Lord will make good his purpose in us. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat>